Hello class and welcome to today's lecture, chapter 10, Life Span Sexual Development, as well as chapter 13, which is going to be Sexual Dysfunctions and Sex Therapy. What you guys just heard a song from the Dead Kennedys called Too Drunk to Fuck, and it really relates to the chapter 13 lecture that we're going to be going over today and sexual dysfunction, um, dysfunctions, as alcohol can create sexual dysfunctions um, at different times in people's lives, and so it's kind of a very fitting song for that chapter. When we're thinking about lifespan, develop, um, lifespan sexual development, we're really talking about the sexual development from infancy all the way up until older adulthood. And so we're really going to be talking about the changes over time that we see, kind of prevalence of different things. Um, but before we get into that, kind of want everyone just to kind of be thinking while we're going through this lecture of what was your first sexual experience like? And what do you think your first, or what do you think your first sexual experience will be like? So if you've already had a first sexual experience, kind of thinking at this time, what was it like? How does this compare to maybe your peers or other people that we're going to be covering this information on? Kind of, or if you haven't had a sexual experience yet, what would you like that sexual experience to look like? What are you thinking about it? What is kind of like the setup or the expectations around that? Another question I want you guys to kind of be thinking about as you were going through this today is, how do you think your sexual life will change throughout your life? So as you get older, as we mature, we get older into our 30s, 40s, as we get into our more senior years and we're in our 60s and 70s maybe, what do you think your sex life will be like then? Will you still be having sex? Do you think it will be an aspect of your life at that time? Or do you think it won't be anymore? Or do you think it will be, but it'll be different on how it's um, the attitudes and behaviors that are surrounding that type of behavior? And the last one I kind of want you to think about is kind of in that sitting in that end is how your sexual like, life look like once you're an older adult. And kind of not just how is it going to change, how is it going to change in terms of partners and going from maybe more casual partners to a more serious um, monogamous type rela sexual relationship. And then in this older adulthood, how do you think you're going to handle that and navigate the challenges of being an older adult and trying to have a sexual life if that's something you choose at that time to do? So when we look at sexual development, we know that there's not a lot of research on this um, because it focuses on young adults. And anyone under the age of 18, we have to have parental consent, consent to. So not only do the parents have to consent to their child participating in the study, but the child has to assent. They have to agree as well on top of it. And so there's not a lot of surveys with people who are under 18 with, um, talking about sexual attitudes and behaviors due to this parental consent um, concern that we run into, and that in order to ethically and methodologic and have methodological soundness to our study, we need to make sure we have parental consent. And it can be really hard in different areas to get that parental consent for their children to talk about their sexual attitudes and behaviors. Again, it's kind of that faux pas. If we talk to, our, if we talk to them about it, maybe they'll start doing it or be more interested versus the idea of trying to figure out what's already being discussed, discussed or thought about within that population. People are afraid that asking them questions is going to kind of spur that as well. Um, so that can be one of those reasons why parents don't want to consent, as well as other reasons like personal preferences, religious preferences. There's a whole slew of reasons. Kind of as, as we've discussed as it is, even though sex and sexuality is a little bit more comfortable of a topic in society today, it's still not something that is readily um, talked about um, in most adult circles. And so even the idea of trying to talk to adolescents, that can be a very big struggle for a lot of parents. Um, so it's that whole idea of this kind of natural avoidance of this topic, and so it kind of permeates the research as well. And then with the other side of it is older adults are often not recruited for research or really even considered it in a lot of research, which is really disheartening. It is a phase of life that we will all go through, um, or we will go through at some point, or some of us, the majority of us will. And so having an understanding of sexuality and what means to be sexually active at an older age is something that we're really missing out on. And so there's, um, and the discomfort of the idea in older adults being sexually active is very, it's a high prevalence. We don't necessarily want to think of grandma and grandpa as getting it on when we're not there. Grandma and grandpa are grandma and grandpa. They do not have sex. They do not have that type of interpersonal relationship. But in reality, they had to for you to be here. Um, and so it's one of those ideas we can't necessarily deny it, but it's one of those things that a lot of us don't necessarily want to think about or acknowledge or kind of allow to exist in our worldview. Um, and so this can actually permeate your own sexual activity during that age is because your own views and stigmas towards that. 
So when we look at infancy and childhood, we see that sexual responses have been shown within infancy um, to the point where male infants have actually been shown to have erections within the womb and can also have dry orgasms. And so because they haven't gone through spermatogenesis and they don't actually have the ability to produce sperm and likely at this time not semen either, they, have, they may produce a, a pleasure response on par with an orgasm without any ejaculatory fluid or those other types of chemical responses going on at the same time. And then infants and children um, initiate genital manipulation which can lead to manipulation that closely resembles masturbation as motor skills develop. And this can be as early as age two and a half. And so because of when we talk about psychosocial development, we talk about the oral phase, the phallic phase, that's where people are getting into their genital region. Um, a stimulation of the genital region, just kind of discovery of it can lead to that stimulation, which can lead to this kind of a masturbatory practice because there is that pleasure principle that can be activated by activating those nerves. Um, and so we can see kind of uh, resembling of masturbation as motor skills develop because of this manipulation and this phase of development when it comes to our psychosocial development. In infancy and childhood, we also have other types of experiences, um, one of which is common for a lot of people is playing doctor. Um, during this age, um, children and infants are um, apt to show their genitals. Um, not necessarily to, for any reason other than the fact that they have them, they want to show them, and it's something new and exciting. Um, as well as kissing non-related children, um, and then rubbing their bodies against each other. Um, and so these things can happen, and it's kind of a developmentally normal experience to kind of go through these different phases, um, or to have some of these different experiences. Um, and that really, this really just emphasizes to us that sexual curiosity, curiosity of my body and your body, or just my body, or curiosity about bodies in general, starts at a very young age. Children know that there are differences between male, female-bodied and male-bodied persons, and so they really kind of pick up on this, and they kind of try and explore and discover what does this mean at this time. And so kind of that's what that sexual curiosity is, is that understanding there's differences between a male-bodied person and a female-bodied person, and kind of trying to discover what those differences are and what they may mean to that individual. After childhood, we kind of have like a plateauing phase when it comes to sexual development. There are some things that are done, but that's more developmentally as you gain better understanding. And then we reach this phase of puberty. And I love this meme. Brace yourselves, for puberty is coming. This can be a really big event in a lot of people's lives. Um, what we typically see is that females are beginning puberty first between the ages of 10 to 12, and that male pu puberty has more of a variation. And so we've seen it happen as early as seven, which is pre, um, precocuous puberty, or as late as 16, which is this delayed puberty, a later onset of puberty. And there are cultural differences in puberty and what it means, um, and what is it like the passage of that. Um, what does it mean in society where for us in the United States, puberty is a change kind of into your teenage years in a thought, um, where some other cultures and societies believe once you go through puberty, you've actually reached adulthood. So you've either that manhood or womanhood. Um, and so it has a different cultural understanding and consequences and um, reactions to it, depending on where you're from. But typically, a lot of times we see during puberty is when you will see the development of those secondary sex characteristics. So this includes um, indicating sexual ma maturity, and this is usually due to the increase in hormones. So what we'll see is we'll see pubic hair development, breast development, deepening of a voice in men, facial hair. And what we generally see is we'll see menarche, which is the girl's first menstruation. Again, that starts between ages around 10 and 12. And then sperm, sperm marque is sperm production and the testes begin. And again, this, diff, this um, happens during puberty. Women are born with all the eggs they're going to have. It's not until men hit puberty where we actually start producing sperm. Um, and these will typically differ across the sexes. So when we're thinking about that, we're talking about like how these are going to develop, like what parts of these secondary sex characteristics are going to develop, and the differences between them that we see is based off those sex hormones. Adolescence is, as defined in psychology typically, is the age between 10 to 19 years old. And 10 is the average age at which women and men experience first sexual attraction. Often, it is a same sexual attraction. 
And so a lot of times what we're talking about at this time is it's kind of like the, um, those first crushes that we get. And it's thought of like, even though it's the same sexual attraction, that it is this type of sexual attraction. And it's kind of this modeling sexual attraction, not necessarily an attraction to them, but an attraction to be like them in that kind of a way. So the development of sexual identity begins. Um, there are several models that exist. There's the six stage cast model in your guys' book on page 270. Um, and there's various different models that kind of talk about uh, the process of developing sexual identity, um, the stages we go through. One of them you can even think of, which we've covered very heavily, is the um, psychosexual model as developed by Freud. Um, though many have existed in, um, to add an update from that. But when we look at the sexual exploration period, so generally kissing is beginning between the ages of 12 and 14 years old is usually when people are experiencing their first kiss. Genital fondling, so this is actual manipulation of the genitals. It's not necessarily that dry rubbing we were talking about, but actual hand manipulation of or fondling of typically begins with the ages of 15, 16. And then generally we see rates of intercourse beginning usually between 16 and 17 years old. One thing I like to always point out is that there's lots of variations across cultures and individuals on when these start happening, kind of the ages and um, in different cultures in which are kind of sanctioned for these activities and sexual exploration to occur. But typically we are seeing this, especially in our society. And one thing that I like to kind of look at here is as you see increased independence, you see an increase in um, the depth of sexual activity or depth of exploration that is occurring. In a sense, a lot of us 15, 16 years old in our country, a lot of us have a driver's license at this time, have a little bit more independence, so we're able to get kind of more away, more privacy, and then that kind of increases even more so as we get into that license in older ages. Um, so it's always kind of interesting to see as the sexual exploration period kind of progresses, it's also our independence also progresses during this time. When we talk about um, sexual attraction and sexual identity, we're also starting to get into the um, venture of romantic relationships. And most adolescents, um, sexual behavior takes place in the context of relationships. And so unlike what we see in maybe older adults um, or young older adults, such as the 20s and 30s, there's not as much of this casual sex um, hookup culture, but it's more of having sex within romantic relationships or having them within this context of a caring bond between two people. This casual sex does occur, but it's not the majority. It's more of a minority type of case situation. Um, and we see definitely um, adolescent relationships can have several problems um, and also have several purposes. One of the big purposes of adolescent relationships is this exploring sexual attraction, right? This is where you're starting to get that first kiss, where you're starting to get those butterflies in your stomach. You're starting to understand what do you do and do not like in a partner? How do you like to be treated by a partner? How should you treat a partner? Um, and kind of exploring what does it mean to be attracted to someone and maybe have some of these sexual urges underneath that as well. Starting to have relationships can also provide a sense of belongingness. So you're coupling with someone, you feel appropriate with them, you feel as though the two of you go together and that you kind of meld very well. Kind of gives you the sense of belongingness that you're not in this alone. And as we all know, adolescence, this puberty period can be very difficult. Um, there's lots of biological changes, lots of educational changes, um, and life changes that occur during this time. And so it really can help to have the sense of belonging when a lot of us are feeling really lost in this phase of life. Another aspect is that stability, having someone to go to, having someone to count on and rely on, not necessarily being the solo force all on your own. Um, and so that can really have a strong purpose of bringing stability. And then also this emotional support. You have a, someone going through similar experiences as you, they can help provide this emotional support for you in those moments of need. And so we start seeing the development of these aspects and they really serve a healthy purpose on teaching adolescents kind of what to do with sexual attraction, how to feel belong, how to feel belonged and loved within relationships, how to give and receive emotional support, and help how to provide a stability for a partner if necessary. And adolescent relationship dynamics are very similar to adult dynamics in the sense of love and commitment. The only difference is, is generally they have more eyes on them and they also have um, more, they can have kind of more rocky intentions because of the instability at this age of going through puberty, the emotions that are involved, all those hormones that are involved. But it's very, very, very similar to the dynamics of an adult romantic relationship. And this is kind of where we learn how to have those adult romantic relationships in the beginning is from these adolescent relationships. 
as we know, there's lots of um, influences on sexual activities um, of anyone, but also on older adults. And so we've kind of transitioned out of puberty. We skipped all the young adulthood, and now we're going to older adults. So the very building adolescent sexual debut is based upon psycho biopsychosocial factors. And that sexual debut, in case anyone is curious, as we have here, is it's your first sexual intercourse. Your debut into the world of being a sexual being, not just thinking about it, but enacting on it. And so when we look at the biological factors, we look at the timing of puberty and physical disabilities. Um, and so for adolescents, the timing of puberty, the younger puberty happens, the more likely you're going to be able at a younger age to engage in sexual activity. If you're on that delayed puberty path, you're going to be a little bit longer. Um, you're going to delay your sexual activity because of that delayed puberty. And then once we start getting older, we start seeing the complexity of physical disabilities, whether that be arms, legs, actual body parts not functioning the way they're supposed to be when we're talking about like genitals or sexual body parts. Um, some psychological factors that really affect um, our engagement in sexual activity, regardless of the age you are, is your attachment style. So whether you have that secure attachment style, whether you have an anxious attachment style or an avoidant attachment style. We kind of discussed in that intimacy lectures that those with an anxious attachment style generally will try and have sex to increase intimacy within a relationship. It's a way to bond with another person. Those who are avoidant, though they engage in sex, they don't necessarily aren't engaging in sex for the romantic reasons. So it's not necessarily for those intimacy reasons. It's more for the physical pleasure side of it. And then those of the secure attachment are more in the middle of that in the sense of they're able to kind of go between both and depending on the sexual encounter kind of enact the script they need. And so it could be one of those to build intimacy or it could be just a pleasurable event that is occurring. But really affects the way or our choices when we um, our sexual activities as well as sexual risk taking. Having a lower social economic status actually increases the risk for um, uh, sexual activity or increases the odds of sexual activity as well as your personality type. As we've talked about, being like open to experiences is going to be increase your likelihood of taking sexual risky behaviors or maybe engaging in sex in general. And then we also have the social factors. So things that we see for younger adults is that the, or for children and adolescents is that less parental supervision, less eyes on you, the more likely you're going to have the time and space to do or have or engage in a sexual activity, which generally requires some modicum of privacy. Um, the parental relationships, so the ability to talk to your parents, their ability to talk to you, um, their willingness to discuss these types of top topics can influence the likelihood of someone en engaging in sex, as well as the media influences. <clears throat> and so when we look at that, this is a percentage of teens of 13 who use Facebook, Instagram, or Snapchat. We have 71%, 52%, and 41%. So if you think about it, and you think about the images we see on Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat, these are highly influencing teens' perceptions of sex, sexuality, sexual engagement, and thus can really be affecting the likelihood of them engaging or not engaging in sexual behavior. As we kind of know, and we kind of see in our society, sex sells, and so sex is kind of everywhere. So this may create an undue influence that sex is more commonplace or should be more engaged in more readily, and then thus increase the likelihood of sex um, occurring. Along with the social factors, even though it's not listed here, is your cultural interpretation and cultural feelings around sex. Um, and so that can have an effect, of course, and it also will affect your supervision, your parental relationships, and also your access to media. So another disclaimer, most of our research in early and late sexual development is really limited, especially when it comes to adolescents and their first, um, first same-sex sexual interactions. Again, most of us don't necessarily, most parents aren't necessarily approving of their children talking to researchers about sex or talking about sex. There's kind of this fear that if we talk about it, they may want to engage in it. And so it even more so when we're talking about sexual minorities, such as those who have same-sex sexual interactions or encounters. Earlier the sexual debut, the less likely adolescents are to use contraception. Um, and part of this is the ability to access contraception um, and the ability and the understanding of the necessity for contraception. I'm hoping after you guys' last lecture, you guys understand the necessity of protecting yourself and your partner. Um, and so what we see is those who are having sex at younger ages aren't necessarily getting the access to contraception or the understanding of it. And so the earlier the sexual debut is related to a higher incidence of sexually transmitted infections as well as pregnancy. 
um, because they don't understand how to stop this. And then as well as delinquent behavior and depression. Um, so people acting out more because of, um, along with their sexual behavior as well as depression as a result of maybe the experience of their sexual behavior or different things that are involved with that earlier sexual debut. Later sexual debut is related to more sexual problems, particularly in men. And so kind of the longer you wait to have sex, there's this idea of like it becomes more complicated to engage in. Um, and it's not necessarily 100% clear on what this exactly is, but it's also this idea of, so there's some cultural um, factors that come into play, um, as well as gender factors. And being a man, you should engage in sexual activity more frequently or more often or at a younger age. And so it can create a lot of psychological factors that really complicate the interaction or the activity of sex. And so these implications should be taken with a grain of salt as research methodology was limited. Um, and is limited in this sense, but this is kind of where we're going at right now is earlier sexual debut, increased risk of sexually transmitted infections and pregnancy, and later sexual de debut, especially for men, we have more sexual problems, which we're going to be discussing here later on in this, the second part of this lecture. There are cultural differences in the perspective of virginity as well that kind of affect early or late sexual development. So in um, Western cultures, we kind of have a stigmatizing view of virginity that being a virgin until married is not necessarily the kosher or cool thing anymore. It's kind of out that you should have some kind of sexual behavior or activity before you end up getting married or getting into that serious long-term relationship. Even hearing things of you got to try it on before you buy um, because how do you know you're going to be sexually satisfied with this person if you don't have sex with them? And so we really have an emphasis that sex is a part of relationships, but not something we talk about, and that engaging in sex isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as we don't know too much about it. It's a really weird dichotomy we have with sex in our country. But really, we really stigmatize virgins, especially when it comes to men and being virgins as they get older. Women is usually seen as like a kind of a kudos or a props that they're able to do that and withstand that. Um, which again is a genderizing view saying that you're not strong enough to withstand on your own. So it's the fact that you are a virgin is amazing. Bullcrap. All of us have the ability to be virgins until whatever time we choose to be. But we really have the stigmatizing view on being a virgin is not a good thing in our society or our country. Where we have other countries where like in Africa and the Middle East that being a virgin is highly, highly desired. Even to the point where, um, like we talked about, female circumcision, right? Female genital cutting is done in different places in like Africa. And part of it is, is to help maintain this virginity that this woman will not be able to have sexual activity until they get married and they're gonna preserve that virginity for their husband. And there are other variations present of this. I know there are some cultures in Africa that believe that sleeping with a virgin will actually cure you of the HIV AIDS virus. Um, and so what we see is we actually see a high incidence rates of virgins becoming um, infected with HIV or AIDS, or HIV actually. Um, due to the fact that they are being forced into sexual encounters to try and cure this disease because of the belief, their cultural beliefs behind that. And so different cultures are really going to have a different idea of what virginity is and what does it mean and the value placed upon it. And as we've seen in our society, that has changed. It used to be having your virginity until you were in, um, in a marriage was the cool best thing to do, where now we have more of this idea of having casual sex isn't the worst thing to do. It's not necessarily overly encouraged, but at the same time, sometimes it's encouraged a little bit because you've got to test the waters to know what's out there is kind of the view that we're kind of taking on it now. But you need to not just be sleeping with anyone and everyone. And that varies on what is accepted as the anyone and everyone and the number, depending on who you are, where you're from, your culture, your gender, all these factors combined. So when it comes to sexuality and aging, health factors influence sexual activity later in life even more so, such as having arthritis, diabetes, cognitive functioning or ability, um, your physical ability. Um, and then individuals are sexually active into their 60s and 70s. You can refer to page 278 in table 10.2 or kind of the last lecture we went on, uh, we looked at when we talked about sexual behaviors. We talked about set people in their 70s and 80s having oral sex, having um, vaginal anal vaginal or anal pen um, penile penetration, as well as having same-sex or opposite-sex partners, um, and not just giving or uh, both giving and receiving these sexual activities. And then most research that's done on older adults involves sexual difficulties. Um, 
and the troubles that they're having due to maybe their medical complications during their aging body. But that also gives us this misnomer that as you get older, you can't have sex because all you have is sexual problems, which in reality isn't the truth. Yes, there are more problems, there are more complications when it comes to sex as you get older, but it is not necessarily um, this place where all you're going to do is face sexual difficulties and not be able to engage in sexual satisfaction and pleasure. A lot of doctors, because of our view of aging and not really wanting to accept that older individuals can be sexually active, actually consider adults, older adults, those who are in those 60s and 70s, to be kind of post-sexual. So they're no longer interested in sex, it's not a really concern of theirs, and probably thinking that they're not engaging in it, which we know is a lie. They are. Why? Because they can. Because it's there. Who knows? The sexual health needs are not being addressed then, and actually there's a big incidence, an increased incidence rate of STIs within older adults and older generations because of a lack of understanding of sexual transmitted infections while they are being educated through life. And so they may not use contraception the same way or be wary of or aware of the fact that they can get an infection like that. And so we're not addressing those needs because we're really not talking to them because we're assuming you don't have sex, so you don't need to know about it. And there's also this other factor of if you're 70 years old, you're, if you're a 70 year old woman, you're a grand, great grandmother in a family, there's this assumption that if you are having sex, you know how to do it because you are of that age. And so there's this kind of, I can't educate you because you should already know, when in reality, we all have different experiences. Even all of you in this class, as we've talked about our experiences, have very different experiences on how sex was introduced to you, how in depth it was, your comfort level with it, kind of what you remember from that. Um, and so we can't necessarily ignore that for older adults as well. Sex is also discouraged in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. I will say, depending on the assisted living facility in the nursing home, you actually can have quote-unquote conjugal visits in which you do have um, sexual activity occurring. And I actually know um, when I worked in a nursing home, we actually had a doctor write a prescription so that a woman could have a dildo so that she can masturbate because it was something that she enjoyed um, she also was a part of her lifestyle and something that we could fulfill, and so we got her a prescription so that we could buy her a dildo and she could masturbate and it be sanctioned in a sense, and we couldn't tell her no or have certain staff, if they were feeling against that, say no, they can't do that when, no, the doctor said they're healthy enough for masturbatory activities. If they want to masturbate, they have the ability to masturbate. Um, so some of this is changing, but at the same time, it's really not encouraged for um, people in assisted living or nursing homes to necessarily have sex or some type of sexual activity. Some biological factors that affect older adults is kind of hormonal changes. Menopause really kicks in, which can cause a lot of women to derail their sexual activity and their libido. And there's also decreases in testosterone over time. And so that idea of decreasing testosterone decreases sexual desire and sexual um, arousal. And so there's this kind of biological drive to kind of slow down our sex, sexual activity and our sex drive. There's also physiological changes. So um, the vaginal dryness is an issue for older women that they aren't producing the same amount of lubrication for their vagina, and so sex can actually be very painful um, without the use of external lubricants. And there also can be difficulty with getting erections, either getting the erection initially, maintaining the erection for a time long enough, um, or a combination thereof. And so these are also issues biologically that really affect the ability to have sex, and sometimes can really affect you psychologically very heavy and cause it to be even more difficult to try and engage in a sexual activity. Some of the psychological factors is kind of cognitive sleep um, or cognitive deficits develop. And so as you get older, one of the things that starts to go is your mind and the ability to control your mind and your thoughts. And so your cognitive deficits will kind of come into play and kind of um, create issues when it comes to engaging in sexual activity. And there's also the factor of at a certain point, you may not be able to actually consent to sexual activity because of the cognitive declines and deficits you have been incurring. And so there may not be a way for you to actually safely engage in sexual activity because there's this lack of consent or understanding of what activity you're getting yourself into. And then there's an increased risk of STI due to a lack of contraception use, lack of understanding that STIs are affecting and infecting older individuals. Um, and that creates psychological factors of what does it mean to have an STI, how do I feel about myself because I had one. Um, there's a lot of stigma around feeling dirty or unclean due to getting one, even though we learned last time that a lot of them are very treatable as well as um, curable, depending on the infection that you get. Other factors that are socially um, affecting 
Um, sexual behavior and uh, activity of older adults is that such as their relationship status. So that could be widowhood, right? Are they, do they have their partner around anymore to be able to engage in sexual activity or did their partner pass away on them? Um, are there living environments? So are they in an assisted living? Are they living alone? Are they living with other people? And it says living along, but that's supposed to be alone. <laughs> and then kind of just the generalized stigma and standards of beauty. When you get older, we don't necessarily think of older individuals as an ideal of beauty. We don't necessarily think of them when we think of beautiful people. We generally don't think of people who are older in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, and so there's can be this kind of self-judgment in that I am not pretty enough to engage in sexual activity. I'm not beautiful enough to engage in sexual activity. Who would want to have sex with me as this older, wrinkly person? Um, and so it can be kind of this devaluing of your own beauty, which then decreases your likelihood of engaging in sexual activity because you fear of your own sexual attraction. Though that was the quick and lowdown of that um, chapter, that is the end of chapter 10, kind of this lifespan development. We've really talked about a little, lot of different lifespan developments as through the last few chapters, talking about sex education, talking about the rates and incidence of STIs and older generations and younger generations. And so now what we're going to get into in this part of the lecture is going to be sexual dysfunctions and sex therapy. And like I said at the beginning of class, this really relates to that song that we first had playing where I'm too drunk to fuck by the Dead Kennedys. Um, and so it's really uh, kind of relating to this idea of dysfunction and this inability to be able to perform these sexual functions or sexual duties that you're wanting to engage in. So when we think of sexual dysfunction, we, dysfunction, we're thinking of persistent sexual issues that create distress at the level of the individual or the relationship. And so sexual dysfunction doesn't necessarily have to exist in the individual, but if it's causing distress within a coupling of people, that can be a sexual dysfunction. And so let's say pornograph, uh, pornography use, right? And so individually, a person may not have an issue with viewing pornography or viewing, let's say, um, X amount of pornography in a week's time frame, but in the relationship it may cause issues and distress. It may cause feelings of unattraction or lack of sexual interest in your partner. And so even though the person looking at the pornography isn't having a problem, it's causing issues within their relationship dynamic, and so we would call that a sexual dysfunction. Not necessarily because one person is dysfunctioning, but it's causing dysfunction in the relationship. The relationship is not functioning to the level it's supposed to be. So dysfunctions can be lifelong, um, can be lifelong, acquired, situation, lifelong or required, and they can be situational or global. And so when we think of this, when we think of lifelong, these are things that sexual dysfunctions that are always going to kind of be with us, they're never going to leave. A lot of these tend to have a lot of more biological causes to them versus something that's acquired, which could be developed because of psychological um, ramifications, psychological factors, your experiences, or even a acquired due to um, accidents, illnesses, and different things like that. We can have them be situational versus global. Um, and so one idea of this and kind of like pointing this out in general is um, there's a lot of guys out there who think being a porn star would be a fun, cool idea. And you talk to them and you'll talk to them about it and they're like, yeah, to get paid to have sex all the time, to have sex with beautiful women, like I can't, I can't imagine a better job. Until you start talking to them about being able to get, maintain, and hold an erection in a group full, in a room full of people watching you, evaluating your sex, telling you how to have sex for three, four hours at a time, right? And we start getting into that and we've even... Um, we start getting into that and we uh, start getting in that conversation of would you be able to do that? Would you be able to um, engage in that activity with kind of that pressure on you? And so there's definitely some people out there who, um, because of the situational pressures, may not be able to perform, so they may not be able to get or maintain that erection for long enough, which is more of a situational variable because of the performance pressures versus global, which is where they consistently have the same issue regardless of whether it's just a one-on-one -on -one situation, it's a bigger situation, regardless of the sexual act or the sexual partner, it still seems to exist. And so that's what we're kind of talking about, the situational versus global. Is it only coming in a, to play in certain contexts and situations, or is it something that seems to be systemically spread throughout all of um, the different scenarios or contexts in which we can engage in sex? 
what, the next one is kind of like what qualifies as a dysfunction is really, really inherently subjective because what is bothersome or bothering one person could not be bothering another. And so what is a dysfunction for you may not be a dysfunction for me or what might be a dysfunction in one relationship, let's say pornographic um, usage, may not be a dysfunction in other relationships. And so I've known, I've had friends who are in partnerships in which one partner in joys porn, the other one finds it very offensive, and so it actually caused a lot of relationship distress until they met on the same page of what is the meaning of porn to both partners, is it necessary, is it not, and how to navigate that situation. Where I've had other people who are in partnerships who pornography is a part of their sex life, it's the built in together, they don't have to watch it together, they can watch it apart, but it's not ever causing them distress, even though maybe they're engaging in it at a higher level, which we would think maybe would be distressing. Right, so there's this subjective quality as kind of how are you feeling and sitting with it that matters more than is it actually happening. And a lack of dysfunction does not necessarily imply sexual satisfaction. And the presence of a dysfunction does not guarantee dissatisfaction. And so there are people who can have a sexual dysfunction, let's say a sexual dysfunction in like a low, low, low libido. It doesn't mean that they're not satisfied with their sex life. It's more of there's a difference in the level in which they want to engage in sex, not necessarily their enjoyment of sex when they do engage in it. And so there's this idea that just because you have a sexual dysfunction, such as maybe low libido, um, doesn't mean, or low sex drive, doesn't mean that you're not necessarily enjoying sex when you do engage in it. It's just you're engaging in it a lot less or want to engage in it a lot less or have that desire to do so. And I will say, there are lots of people who are unhappy in their sex lives, and there is no dysfunction there. It's just not completely satisfying for them. The causes of sexual dysfunction can be wide and varying, and usually are combined, a combined combination of various factors. The first one we're going to talk about a little bit is biological. And that's kind of this aging process, right? So we see hormonal changes, bodily changes, whether that's going through puberty or getting older and seeing your testosterone decrease, going through menopause, um, as well as bodily changes. Our bodily functions start changing. Our body itself starts changing um, as we grow older and we experience more life. Chronic illnesses that can develop over time, such as cancer, multiple sclerosis, diabetes, um, really can have an effect on people's sexual desire, um, sexual activity, as well as create sexual dysfunction. Spinal cord injuries, um, untreated STIs can create pelvic inflammatory disease, or they can also create a disease in epididymitis, which is the inflammation of the, ep the epididymitis, uh, is the inflammation of the vas deferens, which can create sterility in men. Um, Medications can complicate or cause um, changes in sexual behavior. We kind of discussed those, that increasing the amount of serotonin actually decreases sexual drive and desire, where increasing the amount of dopamine increases sexual drive and desire. And then as well as alcohol and drug use can really cause differences in sexual ability and thus create sexual dysfunctions. Some of the psychological factors, one of the biggest one is spectatoring. <laughs> it's really fun to say. Spectatoring, which is really this overthinking over analysis of your own performance. Um, and kind of it's a form of distraction, but it's really like where you're focused on, did I do, how did I do this? What was this body movement like? Was that enjoyable? Was it pleasurable? Was it pleasurable for me? Did my partner enjoy it? Kind of really going in depth about every move and every inch of the sexual practice instead of kind of this idea of just submitting to the sensations and the pleasure of it, you're analyzing each piece of it. Um, and it's really a form of distraction technique from actually engaging in the moment. This could be because of past learning experiences. Sex is a negative or a punishing event, and so you're trying to make sure, did I do it right? Am I going to be okay? Am I going to be praised for this? Or is this going to be another thing that I did wrong? Um, or believing sexual difficulties are more prevalent than they are may lead to constant monitoring anxiety. And so if you're really worried about having a sexual dysfunction on whether you're performing correctly, whether or not um, sexual satisfaction is there, it can really create this anxiety and this over-monitoring where you are queuing into small symptoms and making them bigger and then kind of running with your anxiety with that, complicating the fact that the sign may not actually be indicating what you're indicating and now it may create a dysfunction because of the anxiety you're experiencing over the performance. Other psychological contributors are like poor body image and lack of knowledge. 
Hopefully, the psychological factor of the lack of knowledge is not going to be you guys in my class because we're becoming knowledgeable on sex, and so at least that won't be a psychological factor that brings us down. Poor to body image, though, is of course going to be related to sex and sexual activity. If you don't feel comfortable in your own skin, it's kind of hard to be in your own skin, just your own skin in front of someone else or to engage in a sexual act with someone else. A lot of people think of sex as a very intimate and personal type of act, kind of I'm going to see all of you and not just literally physically all of you, but I'm going to be there with you in this. And so it can really, if you're not comfortable with your body, it can really create this discomfort and over again, this overemphasis on how are, you, how are they reacting to my body as opposed to just being in your body with that person? Also, mental illnesses can cause um, psychological, uh, can be a psychological contributor, such as depression is linked to low libido, bipolar disorder is linked to hypersexuality, um, which is this over engagement in sex or sexually related behaviors. Um, as well as we see that with other things like histrionic personality disorder is something where we kind of see this hypersexuality come out as well. Um, and then biological and psychological factors are often intertwined with one another. And so if you have depression, a lot of times you have a low level of serotonin. And then we give you a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which then decreases your libido. Well, your depression already decreased your libido. So now we're kind of doubling down on your libido in a sense, or at least not taking away the low libido of the depression because the treatment has that same kind of side effect as one of the possibilities. Um, and so we see them very, being very intimately overwhelmed. Because if you also think about it, your psychological factors um, will interact with your sexual desires and your ability to think thoroughly, stop yourself from taking risks, kind of that impulsivity factor, which is a psychological factor, will relate heavily to you engaging in specific acts. So we have this little comic, and I love it. It says, okay, we took our clothes off. I got on top of you. How, long's, how long till it starts feeling good? I don't know, but I've got a headache already, right? So kind of highlighting this lack of knowledge. If you can't engage in sex, it can create a lot of issues around sex. Um, I just think it's really cute. <laughs> Some social factors that can affect sexual functioning is ineffective sexual communication. So if you are not able to talk to your partner about your sexual desires, your sexual wants, your sexual needs, how things make you feel sexually, even if it's, I'm not sure how it made me feel, I just need to talk about it. Um, that can really create a lot of sexual dysfunction. Um, and communication is key. Really, I think I've emphasized this in a different lecture, but I really want to emphasize the fact of if you can't talk about sex, and when I say that, I mean talk about penis, vagina, anus, cunnilingus, fellatio, use these types of words and do it casually with your partner and be able to engage in this conversation, then maybe you guys should think about whether or not you should be engaging in the act of sex or should you be taking a step back and work on the sexual communication to make sure you're both on the same page, you both have the same understanding, and you both have the same goals and desires for what this sex means? Social factors such as relationship problems, such as like unresolved conflict can come in and create sexual dysfunction um, between partners. Um, <clears throat> performance pressures, so like if you're trying to get pregnant, this can create sexual dysfunction in which men can feel that pressure and maybe can't maintain an erection or can't get an erection like they used to. Um, or other various factors such as that. And then cultural and religious views can really be um, a big influencer on sexual activity and sexual engagement. Um, and it kind of makes sense, right? If you have your dominant culture is against or for sex, that's going to increase or decrease your likelihood of engaging in it. And so like East Asian persons report feeling more guilty about pursuing sex and report more sexual problems than European descent. Um, and if we, think, if we think about it in that culture, um, body, sexual body, se um, interacting in that kind of more of a physical nature is not necessarily the um, prioritized way. And there's this real big value on respect um, and decency and pride towards another. Um, and so the idea of engaging in sex or this talk around sex is not really done within that society. And so it makes it harder and it increases the likelihood of people feeling guilt. And then thus, that, because of that guilt, resulting in more sexual problems. So as we can kind of see here, there's the prevalence of sexual problems across the lifespan. Um, and if we look at it, we see a lack of sexual desire. We see between 18 to 29 year olds, we see about 14% of men, 32% of women. Kind of as we get older, we see men stay about the same and women do too. So this seems more like a consistent problem or a consistent dysfunction that occurs over time. 
Difficulty reaching orgasm, we kind of see the same amount, same rates going across. We see 7% to 9% for men, depending on the age. Um, seeing that 50 to 59-year-olds year old, have about a 9% rate of difficulty reaching orgasm. Where with women, we see about a, a little over a quarter of them are having difficulty reaching orgasm at all of these different age points. When we talk about pain during sex, we see for women that at the younger age, they report more instances of having pain during sex or sexual activity. And as they get older, we see a decreased incidence of pain during sexual activity. So for women, we see vaginal lubrication difficulties. 18, 19 year olds, we see about 20%. But then as we get up to the 50 to 69 year olds, we kind of skyrocket up to this 30%. So like one in three women are experiencing vaginal dryness. So they're not having enough lubrication to be able to create um, safely have and engage in sexual activity that's also going to be pleasurable to decrease the friction that is being involved. When we look at erectile dysfunction, we see that men kind of a 7%, and then once we get up to the 50s and 60s, we're seeing about one in five men are kind of struggling with um, maintaining or getting an erection. But then when we look at premature ejaculation for men, we kind of see this consistent rate over time, that there's this consistent about one in three men have this struggle with premature ejaculating or or orgasming prior to the point than what they really truly want to within their sexual act or sexual activity. Now we're going to move on to the types of sexual dysfunction. The first one that we're going to be talking about is dysfunction in desire or desire problems. So female sexual interest or arousal disorder, SIAD, and male hyposexual desi um, desire disorder are both, um, both characterized by few sexual fantasies, a lack of sexual distress, um, desire, and personal distress. So that's a key factor. If you have someone who has a low sexual desire and they're not necessarily personally distressed by it, we wouldn't necessarily call this a dysfunction, right? And so SIAD is, a broad, is broader and also encompasses reduced genital sensations during sex and a lack of responsive desire. Um, so this kind of lack of having a desire due to um, in response to sexual stimulation. And so for men, we type, typically, for both of them, we typically see this, but again, a key factor is this personal distress. If you have someone who has a really low desire for sex or sexual activity, um, and it's not bothersome to them, then actually it's not a dysfunction. It's not creating an issue in their life. And so they may have or desire sex just as little as the next person, but if they're not personally distressed by their lack of desire, then it's not a dysfunction. So it's not something we'd readily seek to treat. A lot of times what we'll see within desire problems is that it's not necessarily a personal distress, but it's within the relationship of partner distress that is being created. Low desire in women is a lot more common than it is men. A lack of desire is not inherently pathological, right? So if we think of that, that's being asexual, having really no interest in partnered sexual activities. Doesn't mean that they don't engage in masturbation or don't think about sex, but it's really just this lack of desire to engage in partnered sexual activities. And then when um, couple members disagree over the frequency of sex, it is known as sexual desire discrepancy. And so that would be a discrepancy in the, how much sex and the sexual desire you have. And so if you're with a partner who really doesn't desire sex, sex isn't that big of a priority to them, and you, uh, sex is a higher priority to you, this would be a sexual desire discrepancy. And kind of that would be under that realm of this relational nature and how we treat and approach this type of problem. Sexual aversion disorder is a formal GSM-4 diagnosis that referred to aversion to any type of partnered sexual activity. Kind of gotten rid of this because if we think of it, we're talking about someone who's asexual. They don't want to have sexual activity with someone else. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and so this has kind of been removed because of this understanding of sexual identity and um, sexu sexual identity management. Um, that we don't really see sexual aversion disorder, we kind of see it as this desire problem that we've been talking about the last couple slides. Compulsive sexual behavior or hypersexuality refers to excessive sexual desire and behavior. It's not currently a diagnosis in the DSM-5, but it is definitely a symptom of many different mental health diagnoses that we pay attention to, such as bipolar disorder, some personality disorders like histrionic personality disorder. And the controversy is over whether or not someone can be truly addicted to sex, and how excessive sex is defined. 
Um, and so we kind of have this fight and this battle going on in the DSM-5 um, and just in addic addictions in general on how to include them, how to understand them, and how to categorize them. And when it comes to the act of sex, how do we talk about an addiction to sex? How do we quantify that? What is considered excessive sex, excessive sex thoughts, excessive sex activities? Um, and kind of how do we get there? And so there's not a consensus in the field yet, but we do know that people have issues due to hypersexuality that negatively impact their life. And so we may not be able to agree on whether someone could be addicted or not, but we do agree that there is hypersexuality that exists. It could be a sign or a symptom of a different mental health condition and maybe its own little um, kind of sexual dysfunction or sexual disorder uh, that we may need to be considering in the future. The next one we're going to be going to is kind of arousal problems. And this kind of bringing up SIAD again, um, the kind of encompasses this persistent difficulty to become aroused. And so this can be considered those uh, lubrication difficulties. And so persistent sexual arousal disorder refers to an uncontrollable sexual arousal that occurs in the absence of sexual stimulation. And so this is someone who is constantly kind of sexually aroused or stimulated and regardless of the stimuli that's being around them. So you can give them a picture of the forest or you can put them in the middle of the forest where they may not be anything sexually related or sexual, um, sexually explicit and they still have this arousal that is occurring. Um, and it's occurring without sexual stimulation as well. So it's kind of occurring without the physical manipulation of the body um, or maybe even lack of engagement in fantasies for people. I really like this. It's this cat. Do you find this arousing? He's just cute. In men, we generally call the arousal problems as generally under the class of erectile dysfunction, or ED, and it's the inability to develop or maintain an erection um, sufficient for sexual performance. And so you may be able to get an erection that lasts um, for a short period of time, but it doesn't actually last long enough to engage in sexual activity. Um, and so this is kind of that idea of... Hi, it's Dr. Sam Robbins. Today's topic is going to be about uh, psychological causes of erectile dysfunction. And today's question is from Chris, and he asks, I've been having erectile problems for a few months now, and I think it's more in my mind than my body. But I'm not sure because I just haven't had much drive for anything lately, especially sex. Can you tell me more about the psychological causes of impotence and what I can do to fix this? Kind of just showing a little video, and there's a link in there too if you want to hear more about erectile dysfunction and kind of what is being spoken about there. It kind of goes on to talk about um, the impacts of sexual um, dysfunction and erectile dysfunction and kind of, like you can hear in that guy's question was, I'm not really having sexual desire for any, or I'm not having desire to do anything, let alone sex. And I feel like it's more in my mind than in my body. There's nothing wrong with my penis and the way it's mechanically built and functioning, but there is a problem with my mind and connecting and being able to um, create this mind-body connection so I can actually engage in this activity. Um, and so kind of what he's talking about there is the fact that he's got this mental block towards sex, that there's nothing wrong with his physical body, but he's just having concerns. And it sounds like, in a sense, that he's facing some depression and kind of some this low libido, low desire and drive for anything that's lack of motivation, that maybe it's actually depression that's coming in and getting a treatment of depression will help increase your sexual desire and arousal. Priapism refers to an erection that will not go away on its own. This is actually a side effect of medications like erectile dysfunction medications like Viagra. And if your erection lasts longer than four hours, you need to get to a doctor. The reason is, is because we are, at, with an erection, you are literally trapping blood in your penis. There's this little um, flap that closes, that allows blood in but not out, and it traps it in there. If you have blood stuck in your penis for an extended period of time, one thing that's not going to be getting to those cells is actually oxygen, right? Because it's not circulating completely through the same way. And so one of the risks that you manage if you don't go after this four-hour period sooner than later, um, you can actually risk the result of losing your penis or having complications or having cell or tissue damage in your penis because of this erection. One thing that I always like to point out is what they do to get rid of this is 
not pretty, but basically what they're going to do is they're going to take needles and insert them inside the penis to be able to drain the blood outside the penis. And so it is going to be a um, forced softening, for lack of a better phrase at this exact moment, of the penis and kind of draining of that blood to kind of allow the circulation to go differently, um, to kind of come back. Got this little Charlie Brown. No, Charlie Brown, that doesn't mean you're allergic to girls having a reaction. He thought he had a hive. It's a hard on. Um, and so really, one of these things that guys, like, really, this is something that's serious. It seems scary, and if it does happen, it will be a little bit scary, but do go get checked out because it's better to go through that pain than possibly have a dysfunctioning penis because of a lack of willingness to say, hey, I've had a boner for more than four hours. Orgasm problems is kind of the next category of dysfunction we're going to cover. And so premature orgasm occurs when an individual reaches orgasm before it's actually desired. <laughs> this is more common or common among men. As we were seeing earlier, we saw about one in three men have this premature ejaculation issue. And it's rare among women. Women generally do not have the issue of orgasming before they were desiring to. Um, and if they did, I'm not sure they're going to be complaining about it because multiple orgasms, they can kind of keep going on that path. Maybe, might cause some issues and some concerns in some women. Some women may enjoy this premature orgasm, this easier ability to orgasm. And this is best defined in terms of subjective distress rather than set time limits. And so someone may think that having sex for seven minutes is optimal. That's good. Not a problem. They orgasm after seven minutes. Oof, that was a good sexual experience. We're okay. Where you might have someone else who's thinking, seven minutes, I'm just getting warmed up. I'm just getting into it. Like, you can't stop then. Like, we need another, like, 7, 12, 15, 20 minutes before we're actually going to be good, right? And so it's really not the set time of, like, you have to be able to maintain an, ere uh, an erection that's being stimulated for 15 minutes for you not to have premature um, orgasm. What it is is the personal distress and the subjective distress on how it relates to the sexual activity. And so a lot of times when people reach orgasm, that's the end of the sexual activity. And so what's happening is you're creating this high level of distress because of a thought of, unsatisfaction in the partner because I came too soon or orgasm too soon. So how could they be pleased? How could they be happy with the performance that we just had? So again, it's really set into this idea of the amount of distress caused in, in either the partner with the premature orgasm or their partner that they're having sex with, um, more so than the actual length of time that someone can withstand orgasming. And then some scientists theorize that early ejaculation in men is evolutionarily adaptive. And so it's kind of this idea that if sexual activity does not take you longer, you're able to ejaculate, which means you're spreading your seed to more women. The quicker you can do that, the more women you can spread that to and increase your reprodu reproductive odds. And so the idea of engaging in long sexual activities may not be evolutionarily adaptive because the purpose of sex from an evolutionary standpoint is to procreate or the creation of the next generation this passage of those genetic material in those genes. Orgasmic disorder or an, an orgasmia is the inability to achieve orgasm or greatly delayed orgasm. And this can be both physical and or psychological factors um, that can contribute to it. Maybe it could be a lack of sensitivity of the nerve endings in that body, that region of the body, or it could be the psychological factors around what sex means to you, how you're able to engage in it, and if you're able to kind of, in a sense that we've discussed in those models, release to the pleasure in those moments, kind of release yourself in those moments. And this is also um, known as delayed ejaculation in men. It usually involves the ability to orgasm during masturbation, but not during intercourse. Um, and so it's this idea that I'm able to masturbate till I orgasm, but sexual activity does not inspire the same type of response, physical response. Um, and so they're unable to orgasm while being involved in partnered sexual activity. After orgasm problems, we see pain disorders. So in men, this is phimosis. phimosis. Um, and this occurs when the foreskin is too tight in the uncircumcised male. And so we've talked about this before in circumcision and how it can actually be a reason for circumcision is because of the foreskin being too tight around the male penis, either while it's soft and or while it's erect. Um, and another thing in men that we see is Peyronie's disease, which is a buildup of scar tissue in the cavernous bodies that creates a severe penile curvature. And so literally what we're talking about is we're talking about a men's penis. Instead of being more straight in nature, it's curving, and it's curving to a really, really bad... Um, high degree. 
Um, a lot of men with a lot of men's penises will have some kind of curvature to it, but this is talking about a curvature that may make sexual activity um, more difficult or maybe even impossible to engage in readily. Um, and it's really this buildup of scar tissue, which can be caused of, because of physical damage or because of just natural development over time as well. In women, we have genitopelvic pain or penetration disorder, or GPD. And this is pain anticipation of a vaginal intercourse or difficulties with vaginal penetration. Um, and so we formally divided it into two separate diagnoses, where we had the genital or pelvic pain during sex, and then we had um, severe contractions of the vaginal muscles that prevent penetration. And, but we kind of coupled them together due to the shared um, understanding of them as we've gotten to know them more. So painful sex is associated with sexual um, distraction and avoidance, but it isn't clear whether the distraction and avoidance is a cause or a consequence of the painful sex. Um, and so that's kind of the idea of like either distracting yourself from sex or distracting yourself from your sexual desires or kind of avoiding it. And we're not sure if it's painful sex is leading to a distraction and avoidance from sex or if these things can kind of cause painful sex to occur because if you're avoiding and have this sexual distraction technique as your stance towards sex, the act of sex may be more painful or uncomfortable for you and so it may create this pain because of these psychological factors that are involved. I think this is going to be dyspareunia and then vaginisms. Vag, vaginisms. It was my attempt. I'm sorry. And those are the main kind of categories of our sexual dysfunctions. What we're going to kind of talk about now a little bit is going to be sex therapy. And so there's many different schools of thought out there, but the first school of thought we're going to talk about is the behavioralist approach. And this is really pioneered by Masters and Johnson, and as we kind of learned throughout this course, they're kind of the pioneers of most of our sexology and sex research and what we know about sex today and how we study it. Um, so it wouldn't be surprising that they kind of pop up here again. And this is based upon learning theory principles. Again, being behaviorists, they really did everything based off of behavior and the principles of learning. And the goal is to change the way people approach sex. So how do you approach sex in a, um, from a behavioral standpoint and learn different sexual behaviors based off that reward and punishment? There's a sensate focus is the most well-known behavioral exercise. And this is a gradually reconditioning process that focuses on teaching relaxation and pleasure instead of anxiety. And so this is commonly used with people who may be anxious about sex or uncomfortable talking about sex or with sexual activity. And so you're teaching them how to relax and how to focus on the moment as it is versus being caught up in their head and their mind and that anxiety and maybe that performance evaluation or that evaluation of self based off of cultural factors or social factors because you're engaging in this act. So it's really the idea of let's teach you to relax be in the moment as the moment is, and give in to the sensations that occur, ideally pleasure, as opposed to the anxiety when thinking about the act of sex itself. Love it. So SIP is an acronym that stands for permission, limited information, specific suggestions, and intensive therapy. So much of what I knew about behavior change and cognition Theories of helping professionals came from other fields like psychology and social work. When I found out about the Plissett model, there was this really cool sense of pride that there was a model that my field, sexology, could contribute to others. And When we talk about this, kind of like she's saying in, in the video that we just watched, this is one of the first models actually proposed by sexologists as opposed to psychologists or social workers or people in different realms. Um, and it's called the Plissett model. And this provides sex education in addition to behavioral exercises. And so it's talking about asking for permission, limited information, and what is limited information, and how does that affect us and our sexual activities. Specific suggestions versus saying you want something different, making sure you're asking for a specific act or a specific behavior, because that's something something can fulfill and give you, right? And that's something you can measure. Did you do it? Did you not do it? Did you engage in it for how long? Those kind of things. As well as this idea of intensive therapy. So this intensive and vulnerable, up close and personal type of therapy that's kind of required because of talking about sex and kind of putting them all together. Johnson and Masters and Johnson reported a 20% failure rate, but how do we define success and failure in sex therapy? Cricket, 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 cricket. 
That's a really good question, right? When we're thinking about sex and we're thinking about the different dysfunctions we just went through, could it be that we've increased their desire? Have we increased their frequency of sex? Have we delayed orgasming to the point where it is a mutually agreed upon um, event and so that it's no longer causing distress? Or are we not able to even reach orgasm and we're kind of changing the way in which we condition ourselves to achieve an orgasm or maybe the definition of what sex is or what satisfying sex is to maybe not include orgasm there, right? So it's really, really hard to understand what exactly they're talking about this failure rate. Is this 20% of couples just didn't change any of their sexual behaviors and that's a failure? Or is it they just didn't ever become satisfied with their sexual behavior? It's really hard to be able to tell. There's not really a consensus on what is successful sex therapy because what is a successful sex life or what is a good sex life is very independent on the, each individual as well as the relationship they've developed between them. Um, and so that's another factor adding to this, what's a success and a failure when it comes to sex therapy. Another approach is the cognitive behavioral sex therapy. And this instructs clients to alter behavior, but also considers the underlying thoughts and feelings that kind of interplay and kind of lead to those behaviors. And so the goal here is to really shape, reshape your thought patterns that generate anxiety. And so as you kind of see here, according to CBT, your cognitions and your behaviors are intimately tied together and they are affected by and a result of your emotions. So the idea here is we're going to suggest different behaviors. We're not necessarily going to attack your thoughts right away. We're going to say, why don't you try and approach this differently? And then what kind of thoughts does that bring up, bring up for you? And we're going to address those thoughts to hopefully change your emotions, that anxiety around both this behavior and your thoughts and these behaviors, right? Part of the idea is if you're able to engage in a behavior, it will change your thoughts around that behavior. And so let's say it's you always feel rejected or turned down when you try to initiate sexual activity with your partner and you're doing it in a way that maybe is coming off as demanding, um, one thing that might be suggested is to try and engage in sexual activity in a more subtle, um, covert type of way versus asking for it more directly, but indicating in a different way. So kind of changing your behaviors, which then may change your thoughts around sex. Instead of being so anxious that you're going to be rejected, you're like, well, maybe he'll actually be excited, or maybe she will actually be excited to pick this up. And so it's this idea that we can, by changing your behaviors, we can alter your thoughts, which will then affect your moods, and vice versa, all the way around. Sex surrogacy is another way, uh, or another form of sex therapy. And a surrogate or practice partner is supplied to the patient as a part of sex therapy. Masters and Johnson reported a high rate of success with this method. Though we do have the ethical and legal concerns of this practice, of how do we actively involve ourselves into or involve a surrogate into the relationship dynamic of partners who are having trouble with sexual activity and then kind of develop an increased sexual desire or sexual activity um, to the point where the couple would be happy to kind of have that surrogate step out and kind of transfer it back to the couple. And then one of the ideas is what if the client develops feelings for the surrogate or what if the surrogate develops feelings for the client and how do you navigate those and how do you navigate these situations where maybe by providing a surrogate you're providing this emotional physical outlet which actually decreases the relationship satisfaction even more so. And so there's lots of ethical and legal issues and considerations when it comes to sex surrogacy but according to Masters and Johnson and reports of others it does have a high rate of success um, and in those successful cases they've had obviously navigated these if they came up successfully um, or else they wouldn't be a successful case for sex therapy. Uh, the fourth type of treatment that we have to talk about is going to be um, your pharmacotherapy. Uh, when we talk about pharmacotherapy, we're talking about different types of medications utilized to treat sex um, dysfunctions. And there's lots of medical drugs that are out there. So like when we talk about erectile dysfunction, one of the first ones that everyone's going to think about is Viagra. There's also Cialis, which is supposed to be taken 30 uh, 24 to 36 hours before sexual activity. It's a rapidly growing field because it's something that talking about sex is difficult, so trying to go to therapy about sex and trying to go to therapy with your partner about sex can be really uncomfortable. And so it's really easy to turn to a medical provider to get some kind of medication to take to solve the problem versus diving into the psychological ramifications or consequences and meanings of sex for you. Though it really is controversial because it refocuses the emphasis of sex therapy onto the individual 
instead of the relationship. And so it's you need to be fixed versus this relationship dynamic, this bond between us needs to change for us both to feel comfortable and fulfilled within this relationship. As with everything, there are critiques. And so sex therapy critiques, um, there's increasing resilience, uh, reliance on drug therapies as the front line. And so using drugs as opposed to trying to engage in talks about sex, sexuality, and that sexual identity development within therapy. There's also very unclear definitions of what is a success or failure within sex, uh, sex therapy cases. And the, the ooh, dis blah, blah, blah. definitions of dysfunction and normal sexual functioning are really arbitrary and culturally relative. And so kind of what we even talked about before is like, how do you define sex? How do all of us define sex? Do we include oral sex in our definition of sex? Do we include hand genital stimulation as a part of sex? Or is that just all stuff that's not sex, but sexually related? And so even this des definition of what is normal sexual functioning or what's dysfunctional can be really arbitrary. And so it's really hard to say, what do we need to treat? What do we not need to treat? And kind of to sum this up in a different way, Saw's 1990 says, one person's problem is another person's desired outcome. And so in one coupling, you may have a partner who has a um, low sexual desire. You have a, the other partner has a hypersexual desire. Well, if you got them with different partners and you got them to match up in that sexual desire realm, high, hypersexual and hypersexual, they're not going to see an issue with that, right? They're going to see that as a normal sexual functioning, even if they're having sex at the rate of three or four times that of their normal average peers, right? And so it's kind of these differences um, between us and what we feel and our partner that kind of creates a dysfunction, as well as the idea that just because you have a higher sexual functioning doesn't mean you're dysfunctional, it just means you might need another person who has that same type of functioning to have more of that successful, satisfied relationship. So specific treatments, um, so treating desire problems, there's cognitive therapy or cognitive behavioral sex therapy with the goal of enhancing intimacy and communication, um, as well as the use of pharmacotherapy, such as testosterone supplements, if it is more of that biological realm that's kind of dictating that desire and that change in desire. Treating female arousal problems, generally there's a hormone therapy for physical causes, behavioral therapy and CBST for relational and psychological causes. And then EROS clitoral therapy device, um, the female penis pump, draws more blood into the clitor um, clitoris. Um, and so what that does is it literally increases the ability to be aroused because it kind of pulls the blood there and that's kind of the process of arousal. And so it's kind of mimicking that biological process of becoming aroused um, as a way to increase arousal and sensation during sexual activity. Um, having an erection that lasts more than four hours, that's where we get the um, preopism, which is the drain with a needle or via medications that allow blood to exit the penis. Again, that idea is to let the blood come out of the penis so that you can have increased blood flow and oxygen to the penis again, or else you're going to have death of cell tissues down there. Um, erectile dysfunction, so cognitive behavioral sex therapy for psychological causes, drugs, pumps, and implants for physical causes. Viagra creates the capacity for erection and helps most men with erectile dysfunction, though it can be an expensive medication to be on. Pumps are a temporary, are a temporary solution and they draw more blood into the penis um, via vacuum mechanism. A lot of people who end up using uh, penis pumps and this vacuum mechanism will also use um, cock rings. And this is a ring that they can put at the base of the penis and that will help trap the blood flow in the penis. And so it's a way to mimic a natural erection, but kind of force an erection so you can still engage in sexual activity. And then implants involve placing a semi-rigid rods um, or inflatable cylinders into the carnivorous bodies of the penis to allow for erections. So um, these semi-rigid rods kind of allow for bending and stuff like that, but they also provide the structure of an erection. Or these inflatable cylinders, which you kind of inflate to mimic the blood flow or increase blood flow through the penis to create that erection um, as well. When we talk about premature orgasm, there's lots of different techniques and things that are used. Um, one thing is called the squeeze technique, which is where you squeeze the head or the base of the penis to prevent impending ejaculation. You wait and then restart. Another one is the start-stop technique, which is you stop sexual activity at the point of impending orgasm, wait until that response has kind of gone away, and then restart sexual activity. And the idea is that you're going to increase pleasure until you're about to that orgasm point, 
You're going to allow yourself to rest. You're going to allow yourself to kind of come back down. And then you're going to re-engage in that orga or arousal process, but not reach orgasm again. And the idea here is, in this process of engaging and then waiting, you're increasing the length of sex, which is ideally going to increase the satisfaction between you and your sexual partner. Another practice that can be done and um, can be done on more of a solo practicing, this start-stop sexual technique, I think of it as like sexual activity, so this is with a partner, where edging is the practice of stimulation to the point of orgasm, but not orgasming, and repeating again. And so there are men out there who have erectile dysfunction who will engage in this practice of edging. So they'll masturbate till they get really close to orgasming, stop all forms of masturbation, kind of wait for their sexual desire and arousal to go away, and then start again. The idea behind this is you're kind of teaching your body to withstand the orgasm itself to kind of not just naturally give in to that take, uh, to that biological process, um, and kind of giving you a sense, uh, kind of a more of a un felt understanding of what does it mean to orgasm so that maybe you can stop yourself from kind of over reaching that tipping point um, in the future when you're actually having sex with a partner. And there's other methods include taking SSRIs and the use of numbing agents. Um, there are condoms out there that do have a little bit of a numbing agent inside of them, and so that's to increase the, likely, uh, the length of sexual activity by decreasing the sensation to the penis. Um, and again, it's this idea of trying to delay orgasm, not stop it, but delay it to increase the timing and the act of sexual activity. As we've kind of seen before, this can be very important for women in heterosexual um, partnerships because that ability to reach orgasm generally takes a clitoral stimulation in addition to vaginal stimulation, and so increased time can increase the likelihood of that occurring for women. When we talk about orgasmic disorders, we talk about behavioral, uh, behavioral therapies as well as cognitive behavioral sex therapy if its relational or psychological factors are contributing. Kegel exercises may enhance genital sensations, and so that's kind of increasing the blood flow, kind of your responsiveness down there, and kind of activates them. So it's this idea of like activating this area through those Kegel exercises, which boys or girls can do, um, can increase this idea of being able to reach or um, reach orgasm because you're increasing the sensation that is occurring. And then switching to non-SSRI antidepressants may help if the cause is a medication side effect, and so making sure that. Um, you know your medication and their side effects, and if there's a way to kind of change it so that sexual um, dysfunction is not one of those main side effects, you can do that. Um, but also at the same time, make sure you're maintaining whatever aspect of your health as priority. We talk about the treatment of pain disorders. Um, we talk about phimosis, which is the circumcision or dorsal cut um, and topical steroids, and this is for the issue of... Um, men having too tight a foreskin on their penis. What we'll do is we'll either do a dorsal slit, which is that semi-circumcision, um, semi or a full circumcision, which creates a lack of pressure because we're kind of removing that skin and kind of opening it up so that it's not being restricted in the same way. So Peyronie's disease, we can use anti-inflammatory medications. Um, if it's more of this beginning stage of the development of Peyronie's disease, or there's actual fixing due to surgery, kind of removing those... Uh, scar tissue, that build up a scar tissue, which will allow the change in the shape of that erection to occur. For GPD, we, for vaginisms, the use of Botox or dilators may help, and so that's the contraction of the vaginal muscles, generally preventing uh, penetration from occurring. And then we have for genital pain, the treatment depends on the cause. Is it trauma? Is it infection? Is it dryness? Depending on the cause is depending on the route of treatment. And so if like, we have a traumatic experience that has happened, we may go through a psychological realm. If we're talking about it's just not enough lubrication being naturally produced, then we help provide lube and education and understanding of that. Or it can maybe be an infection, whether it's a sexually transmitted infection or other type of bodily infection that's creating pain during um, sexual intercourse. So at the end of this, the very last slide I have for you guys is the tips for avoiding sex difficulties. One of the biggest ones, one of the biggest ones, one of the biggest ones is going to be communicate both verbally and non-verbally about sex and your likes and dislikes. If you can't talk about it, maybe you shouldn't do it, but you should be able to talk verbally and non-verbally about your likes and dislikes. And so it's also this idea of not all our communication has to be verbal, you telling me what you want or me telling you what I want or me telling you how I like it. It could also just be your reactions in the game or in the not game, in the act of sexual activity and kind of how you respond to your partner, kind of how you encourage them in that moment. There's these nonverbal expressions of your likes and dislikes, right? If you're not telling your partner what you don't like and they keep doing it, 
you're not going to be as satisfied during sex. Or if there's something you really desire from your partner and you like it, you need to communicate that to them. And part of this is also going to be being receptive to communication from your partner, being receptive to the idea that because your partner tells you they want something, it doesn't mean you're not doing sex well, that you're not engaging in sex or they're not satisfied. It just means that there's something else that they're wanting. It does not necessarily have anything to do with your ability or your merit as a partner, but it's more of if I enjoy this, I should be able to ask for it. Or if I don't enjoy this, I should be able to say, hey, I don't want this and it should be okay and be able to be communicated with each other. But we all get kind of, um, because it is a taboo subject, we can get kind of defensive and we, oh, I'm not good at sex. Oh, you don't enjoy sex with me. This idea of opening communication and making sure you're being open about it and knowing that if your partner's trying to talk to you about sex, they're coming from a very vulnerable place. It's hard to talk about. And so give them the benefit of the doubt in the sense of they may be coming to talk to you, telling them something they don't like. The reason they're telling you they don't like it is because they enjoy sex with you otherwise and they want to engage with you in sex in a way that's enjoyable for the two of you. And so it's kind of this idea of even if someone's telling you, you're doing something that I don't feel is quite right for me, to take that as... I enjoy sex with you, so I want to let you know how to please me. So it's kind of this idea of changing our communication instead of being so defensive on it, being, oh, you want me to be there for you. You want me to please you. Please tell me how. Do not think that you have to achieve something each time you have sex. There's no goal about the length of time, about the size of orgasm, about simultaneous orgasm. It's kind of remove the pressure from sex. Sex is supposed to be this kind of fun, casual, weird, awkward, noisy, funny expression and interaction between two people. And so making it goal-oriented, making it this thing where you have to do it or you have to perform in a certain way can really complicate and create sexual difficulties because then you're just having this judgment and this anxiety associated with an act that is supposed to be mainly pleasurable. And then also take care of yourself, both physically and psychologically, making sure that you're on top of your sexual health. That includes STIs. I'm talking about also getting that hand mirror and checking yourself before you wreck yourself because if you don't know... If you don't know what you look like now, you won't know what you look like after you've been blown. And so you really need to get that understanding. And then also psychologically, making sure you have this comfort around sex if you're going to be engaging in sex, or what is your level of comfort around sex um, and sexual activity, and kind of how you're going to communicate that with your partner and kind of how you're going to deal with ramifications of sex and sexual activity. I really hope you guys enjoyed today's lecture. It was a lot of fun for me. I think kind of discussing the lifespan and then all these dysfunctions and kind of putting them in the place of the lifespan is kind of interesting. And I hope to see you guys all next week in my next lecture.